I'm Dennis Anderson, and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. Minnesota State Senators traveled the Arrowhead region this week, looking at potential infrastructure projects for the next state bonding bill. We'll have a report. A Duluth native has a new series airing on PBS this fall. We will meet Ian Grant, producer and host of Culture Quest. And Aaron Brown is our guest on this week's Voices of the Region segment. These stories and more coming up right now on Almanac North. Hello again and welcome to Almanac North. Thank you very much for watching. Julie Zenner has the night off. Topping the headlines, a Duluth native who was tapped by President Biden to be the U.S. Ambassador to Israel had his nomination hearing this week. Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar introduced Tom Nides to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Let's take a look. Tell you a little bit about Tom. He grew up in Duluth as the youngest of eight siblings. His father, Arnold, served as the president of Temple Israel and of the Duluth Jewish Federation, and his mother, Shirley, was a teacher. His sister, Jane, told the Duluth News Tribune that their parents would be going crazy with joy if they were alive to see their son nominated to serve as ambassador to Israel. Um, I was amused the day that Tom was nominated to read the headline in the Duluth News, which said simply this, man who grew up in Duluth nominated ambassador to Israel. Tom was innovative from a young age. As a senior at Duluth East High School, he was tasked with finding a speaker for his high school graduation. Being the proud Minnesotan he was, he wanted Walter Mondale, who just happened to be Vice President of the United States. He learned that the best time as a high schooler to catch the Vice President's Chief of Staff was at 5.30 in the morning. He reached out and Walter Mondale agreed to speak at his high school graduation. He was a trusted advisor to Congressman Tony Quello and to Speaker Tom Foley. Uh, he worked for Mickey Cantor in the office of the United States Trade Representative, and he later served as Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources with Secretary Clinton under President Obama. During that time, he distinguished himself as a key voice on Israel and an advocate for humanitarian support for our U.S. allies. For his outstanding service, he was awarded the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, our country's highest diplomatic honor. His private sector and trade background, as well as his strong background in Middle Eastern policy, makes him the perfect choice to serve as our ambassador to Israel. Nides has previous government experience and is currently the managing director of Morgan Stanley. Duluth's Complete Count Committee held a news conference this week to announce a slight increase in the city's population. The city grew by a little over 400 people, according to the 2020 census. Duluth is also becoming more diverse, with residents of color now making up 16% of the population. Businesses in St. Louis County are encouraged to apply for the Minnesota Main Street COVID relief grants. More than $64 million are available to businesses that can demonstrate financial hardship due to the pandemic. Businesses that did not receive assistance from previous state relief programs will receive priority for these grants. And Minnesota officials announced today they're recommending Pfizer COVID-19 booster shots to state residents after federal guidance was announced. Minnesotans who are 65 and older and received the Pfizer vaccine at least six months ago should receive a booster. Younger folks with underlying medical conditions should contact their health care provider to see if boosters are recommended for them. The 2022 Minnesota legislative session is a few months away, but state lawmakers were out on the road this week for a tour of projects eligible for state bonding. Members of the Senate Capital Investment Committee toured the Arrowhead region by bus to see projects for themselves firsthand. WDSE videographer Steve Ash caught up with the lawmakers during a stop in Grand Rapids. Well, I used to serve on the bonding committee. I think the bonding tour is important because a lot of times you see a description on paper and you don't really know what it is. Like, for example, a previous bonding year 
had uh, Hibbing Community College that had a project that was 12 million to reorient the front door. You said, well, that seems like a lot of money to move a door, but it was a lot more than that. Seeing these projects in person really helps you understand what exactly the needs are for each of these individual campuses and why the state should be a part of funding those. Come on in, let's take a look at the space. So the first project we're visiting today is at Itasca Community College, and they have, again, it's HEPER. HEPER means asset preservation. It's taking care of what we already own, what we already have on these campuses to make sure that they can continue on so we're not having to tear these properties down at another point in rebuilding. A social type of gathering for students to build. The legislature in the even-numbered years uh, does a, always does a bill where we sell general obligation bonds that are paid for with state general fund money that invest in public infrastructure around the state. So leading up to the, to the uh, 22 session, uh, the bonding committees, House and Senate, normally make tours around the state and take a look at public projects that uh, have submitted proposals to uh, the administration for funding. I don't think we probably have time to go look at some of the old air handling equipment, but it's really old and decrepit from 74. It's all lived its life uh, many times, and it's really inefficient, it needs to be replaced. Well, some of determining what the priorities for the committee are going to be are, are just based by getting out on the ground and looking at projects, seeing what the most urgent needs are. Uh, there were about $5 billion worth of requests turned in to uh, the administration in, in June. They tabulated all of that and sent that over to the legislature. So we've picked off a, a number of projects to take a look at. We're never going to be able to see all of them. We'll get back to St. Paul, and, and generally the, the spending gets put into categories, uh, generally about higher education at Minsk and the University of Minnesota generally get about a third of what's in a capital investment bill. Uh, then there'll be money at DNR, of course. Nobody owns more buildings in the state than the Department of Natural Resources does. Uh, highways, bridges. Of course, the Public Facilities Authority is the agency that does wastewater and water infrastructure. Uh, and the state always helps with those kind of investments that relieve some of the local burden on, uh, you know, homeowners and businesses that have to, you know, pay the costs of wastewater and water infrastructure. We're going to look at the Grand Rapids water treatment plant today. As long as we're here, they've got a, a pretty significant project that they need to do. Welcome to Grand Rapids. This is a water treatment center. I'd like to introduce Julie Kennedy as the general manager. We've got five wells. We pull groundwater from two different aquifers, one real deep, about 570 feet, the other anywhere from 125 to 175 feet. I would love to answer questions, any of us, or we have um, tours inside. If you get somebody from the water treatment facility and the mayor and maybe a couple members from the community to say this is a good idea, those kind of things help. So we do really rely on uh, people that live in any individual district, their testimony to help us get those projects across the finish line. Because if you don't have somebody uh, really serious about it in the community, it makes it harder to pass. So we do need those local folks to help us along the way. So members will submit uh, bills to the committee for the committee to consider. The governor will come out with his bonding recommendations in January. Uh, we'll then try and digest all the bills that have been introduced, what the governor's requests have been, get it into a larger capital investment bill, one bill. The bill that passed in 2020 was about $1.8 billion. It's a good time uh, to invest in public infrastructure. Interest rates are at historic lows. Uh, the most recent uh, bond issue that the state went out for in August, uh, we sold bonds to invest in public infrastructure and we received an interest rate of 1.7%. So that's pretty favorable lending time. So it's really a good time to, to get caught up on some of the deferred maintenance and asset preservation we have around the state. The biggest goal of the three-day bonding tour is really, again, back to what we already talked about, and that's just seeing these projects in person, being able to look with your own eyes, touch with your own hands, understand what these projects are, so that way when the committee goes back to St. Paul, they're going to be talking to individuals who might be looking at a piece of paper that says reorient a front door for $12 million, and these people from the committee will be able to say, no, wait a minute, that's not what it is. Here's the whole scope of it to be able to help the legislature get a bill like this, a bonding bill across the finish line.
A new program airing on PBS stations across the country this fall is produced and hosted by a Duluth native. Culture Quest takes viewers on an international journey looking at life through the eyes of the world's artists, artisans, and keepers of culture. And so joining us now is Duluth native and Minneapolis resident Ian Grant to talk about his new show. Ian, how in the world did you get to produce a program for PBS? Yeah, it, it, took, uh, it took five or six years to, <laughs> it did, to put huh? it together, and there were several, several uh, iterations of it. But, uh, you know, ultimately, I, I took what I had a show on, on the Travel Channel right. ages ago, and you could be one of at least 100 people that watched it. It, <laughs> it was very briefly on there, but uh, I kind of took what, what we did there and wanted to turn it into something a little more in-depth and chased after it for, for a while. Uh, but really in earnest, maybe five years ago, we talked to uh, PBS and they showed some interest and then the wheels started yeah. turning. And, and as you probably know, a big, a big aspect of it is chasing after it. As, as a producer, you have to get it funded. So a lot of the time we you spent bet. trying someone to fund it. But once that happened, we were off and running. So uh, what's Culture Quest all about, Ian? Yeah, it's, it's a show that looks at life around the world through the window of art and artisanship and, and cultural traditions. So using, uh, you know, we visit with modern artists in, in Ghana or with uh, you know, Mongolian nomads in, in the west of Western Mongolia who hunt with golden eagles and, you know, uh, look into those unusual things that sure. they do but then use that as a window into where they are, where they've been, what they're, uh, where they're going in, in the future. So it's, it's trying to treat, it's trying to look at these things without uh, uh, placing uh, the objects in a, in a glass container yeah. as, as you know, something in the past. We really want to tackle it as uh, moving into the future. We have some video. Let's take a look at what this show is like. Yeah. I'm Ian Grant, and I've spent the last three decades using my background in history and art history, exploring cultures all around the world. In this series, I'll take you to places I've never been to before, experiencing local life through the lens of the world's artists, artisans, and keepers of culture. This is Culture Quest. We're on our way to the Golden Eagle Festival, way out in Western Mongolia. Nomadic uh, culture out here is clearly still alive and well. Things get heated up today. You know, they've been training for a year and it all comes down to this. If they don't land it, they're out. this little uh, kind of sea gypsy village of Jamestown and we're gonna hopefully get out on the ocean in one of these boats it should be pretty cool getting the taste of this local hard hard lifestyle a lifestyle that's kind of under threat with overfishing and climate change and didn't realize it just sliced open my fingers. But in the face of dwindling fish, of pollution, that they still come out with hope to catch. With hope to catch a handful of fish. Yeah. The people that got killed ran this way, yes. directly into the bullets. And you escaped through the cemetery. At the back side, yeah. When they captured me, they tortured. They tortured you when you yes, were nine? Yes, yes, Is that a well? After they kill people, then they just dump it down. We're just pulling into Yerkala, this aboriginal community up here where incredible works of art are going out around the world to major museums. Nice to see you. How long do you think that will take? One year. A year? Yep. Mud muscle. So you find them with your feet. You got three? Holy man. Tasty muscles. Spectacular. We're driving the Pond Siauco. We're not sure what we're going to find down there. Other earthquakes come through, so they're staying here where it's safe. You can see a huge chunk there has fallen off. This island seems to get beaten up. 
<laughs> but, but over yeah. and over again. Super cool. Let's go see another. Mine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so the competition begins. No one's expecting flawless Japanese to come out of this redhead, blue-eyed guy's mouth. I like that, that tourists will get into their national dress as they're touring another city. Can you imagine going to Gettysburg and throwing out the soldier's uniform? Yeah. They pulled it. I don't know how we leave this scene, because that just happened. <laughs> We've gotten around to a lot of countries, a lot of places with struggle. And a lot of it revolves around identity and people trying to figure out their own identity instead of the one that's been presented to them by us, by colonial powers. This is you? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh my God. It'd be cool if we could actually use this in this show. around for crayfish and crocodiles. Hopefully more of one than the other. That's good, that's good. Oh. In my hiding place. Hole here where he had to escape out. I mean, we're gonna have to blur a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> so Ethan, what have you learned about cultures around the world? Are we kind of the same, yet different? Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of what, what I'm chasing after in this show, because on, on the one hand, as you saw in all those clips, there's some pretty fantastic and us uh, pretty unusual things that you see. And I like that element because at the same moment, when you're talking to those same people in all these various corners of the globe, they all have these similar goals. They want to put food on their table. Sure. They want to have uh, you know success for their children. They want to stay connected with their past, but have an exciting future. All these things that should be and are familiar, familiar to you know, people all around the world. And I, I like that juxtaposition between the two. You can see something, wow, pretty amazing, <laughs> but in the same breath, oh, I totally get what they're trying to, sure. where they're trying to go. Yeah. You graduated from Duluth Cathedral High School about 34, 35 years ago. Yeah. Back in high school in those days, were you thinking about this is the kind of a job, a career you like to have, go and explore and find different cultures and put them on television? No, not, not at all. Not at that all? Never, never occurred to me. You know, I, I, had, uh, I was either thinking of going to law school or become a professor and uh, ended up, uh, you know, taking the GREs and all that stuff, but in the meantime got a, a, a good job as a 20-something and was excited coming out of college finally, you know, making yeah. a little money and forgot about grad school. But, but the direction I went after was still kind of into art history, which was one of my degrees in history, uh, was the other. So I was going after jobs and eventually my own business that played into that. So I started, uh, uh, well, for a while I worked for a Persian rug company and those uh. guys uh, let me do a lot of the buying and a lot of the writing and advertising and of course the selling. And then I took that and started my own company uh, basically traveling around the world, finding objects and bringing them back to the United States, but objects with the story that, yeah. that points to the, that point to the culture that they're coming from. So when they come back to, you know, those objects find their way onto a shelf in Duluth or Miami or, or Colorado and Denver, those objects tell those people in those locations, the story of uh -huh. something in Southern India or Northern Thailand. So what have you learned about the culture in our country if you compare it with other countries around the world, are we still aiming for the same goals? Yeah, we, we are. I, and, and I realize at times, uh, you know, we can, we can seem pretty fractured, but, but once you eliminate all that noise, uh, I think everyone around the world is just trying to find those, those simple goals, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and, and get their lives moving forward and the, the next generation moving forward. And that's the commonality. All if, around. if you hadn't have been born and raised in the United States, and you've been around the world a lot, yeah. is there another country that you could have enjoyed being born and raised in? 
Well, so my, my parents, my mom's from Dublin and my dad's from Inverness, as, as we've talked about before. So, and, and we would every now and then live in, in England when my dad was running a sabbatical. So I find a lot of uh, comfort yeah. in England, but you know, Duluth was always, always home. Ian, I've got to wrap it up. Thank yeah. you very much for being here. Ian Grant, Culture Quest is the name of the show on PBS. Thanks for being our guest. Thank you. Thank you. It's time now for this week's edition of Voices of the Region. Each week we hear from a journalist in the area about the stories they are covering. This week, columnist and author Aaron Brown from Northern Itasca County is our guest. You know, the global economy has driven down prices for a lot of goods that we've come to expect. You know, clothing and food are much smaller parts of the budget, a family's budget, than they were, um, say, 100 years ago or 80 years ago. Your grandparents and great-grandparents paid more out of their paycheck for shoes, for instance, than we do. But um, this, the downside, A, of course, we've watched as a lot of jobs have gone overseas. But the flip side, too, is that whenever there's a disruption, and it could be a typhoon, it could be a political unrest in a certain part of a certain country, or it could even be something that they've been experiencing, which is a shortage of shipping containers, those big metal boxes that they put on the ships um, to go from China to San Francisco or Seattle, for instance. The shortage of those is enough to throw off supplies of plastic components. You know, what I wrote about was the notion of maybe having to rebuild supply lines domestically, including manufacturing lines, making things that maybe we haven't made as prolifically in a while. And with that will come some new challenges for consumers in the form of prices. You know, we might have to pay more for something that's produced closer to where we live, but there are side benefits of that as well, including jobs in the economy. I can't believe how high the spot price of iron ore has hit this summer. At, at times, it's been over $200. Uh, keep in mind that when the iron ore uh, mines here close or, or go into shutdown, the prices are often down around $50 or even $40 is really low, and that might cause a dip. So just imagine how much higher those prices are now, well above the cost of production uh, for um, iron ore. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is, is something that I noticed happened just this last week. There was a disruption of sorts in the uh, Chinese financial sector. The Chinese government, um, run by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, decided to rein in some of the private capital funds that uh, exist in China. You know, they, they've been going through a complex process of they're, they're a communist government, but they've been opening up some of their markets a little bit to be competitive in a capitalist uh, world. And uh, the, the, the government backed off that a little bit, and it really disrupted um, markets. It was purely a supply and demand issue. Now it's supply and demand and also market influence of foreign governments. And it's not all within the control of our own consumers anymore. And that's, that's a cautionary realization. You know, once you realize that, you realize that, you know, um, we have to be able to, to navigate a world that we have less control over. And, and that will be a challenge. It's been a challenge for our country on, on many levels. I took a side, so this is bias, of course. I took the side of um, a certain uh, croc long snouted crocodile from the Crustaceous period. Uh, Terminorus robusta is its scientific name. At one time it was Terminorus um, masabus, or it had the uh, the name of the Masabi Iron Range in it because when it was discovered at the Hill Annex Mine in Calumet on the Western Masabi Iron Range um, back in the ooh, 40s, um, quite some time ago, um, it was believed to be a new species. And so it was actually named for the Masabi Iron Range. Now the, the scientific community as it does uh, evaluates these things and compares it. And it's currently believed 
that maybe it was actually an example of the Terminoris robusta, this other species. Anyway, doesn't matter. This crocodile lived on the range. Uh, granted, it was uh, separated by tens of millions of, of years. So there's this competition with the Minnesota Science Museum. Uh, they're having, they want to nominate a fossil to be our state fossil. So the legislature would have to get involved. And they're having an online vote. I think there are nine fossils from different parts of the state discovered in different parts of the state. Um, our, our Iron Range crocodile is, I don't believe, leading currently. It was actually lagging um, behind some other fossils. Um, but you want to check it out because there's some really cool fossils. And even if our crocodile doesn't make it through, um, there's some really cool fossils that really reflect the, the very you know, prehistoric ancient history of, of um, life here in northern Minnesota. And that's our time this week, but you can keep up with our latest posts by following Almanac North on Facebook and Twitter. Visit the WDSE websites for updates on programming, news about upcoming events, and more information about our station. And be sure and download the PBS video app for on-demand viewing of your favorite PBS programs. And a reminder, Julie will be back with us next week. Thanks to our guests and the crew here in the studio. I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind.